Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India In this lecture, I am going to introduce you to the notion of equivalence of matrices. And also tell you what it has to do with isomorphism of modules. To start with, let's look at the definition of equivalence of matrices. This is an equivalence relation on rectangular matrices over a commutative ring R. So let R be a commutative ring and let's say M, M by N R denotes the space of all M by N matrices with entries in R. This is not a ring, it's just a set. Definition we'll say that x, y in M and R, we say that x is equivalent to y, if there exist two matrices A in GLM, R and B in GLN R such that Y is equal to AXP. So um, it's not difficult to see that this is an equivalence relation. It follows from the fact that uh, these are basically this basically an action of the group GLM R cross GLN R on M M by N. This be M by N here. And these equivalence classes are called equivalent matrices. So the uh, relevance of uh, equivalence of matrices to um, uh, the study of modules comes from the following theorem. If X is equivalent to Y, then you can look at the module Rm mod the column space of X. This is going to be isomorphic to Rn for column space of Y. Isomorphism of R modules. We've already seen that um, every finitely generated module over a Noetherian ring is going to be of this form. And so now, once we have the matrices, we can also use this equivalence notion to try to understand when two modules given in this form are actually isomorphic. So how do you prove this? So recall, what is the column space of the matrix X? The column space of the matrix X is nothing but all vectors of the form x times v, where v is a column vector in Rn, so if x is an uh, m by n matrix. And uh, now suppose b belongs to uh, g, l, n, r, and y is equal to xb. Then column space of y, well, that's uh, y, v, v belongs to Rn, but that is x, p, v, where v belongs to Rn. But I can think of this bv itself as a vector in Rn. So this thing is contained in the column space of x. Okay. And since b belongs to gln r, b has an inverse. And I can write x equals y b inverse. So then I can apply the same argument uh, by replacing the role of x with y and b with b inverse and I get that column space of x is con 
equal to column space of yb inverse which we'll see is contained in column space of y so then together this means that column space of x is equal to column space of y so firstly what we see is that rn mod column space of x is equal to rn mod column space of y if y is equal to x times b where b is in glnr so this is one side of the notion of equivalence that y is x times b what about the other side so let's now look at the case that uh, y is a times x a belongs to glmr and uh, so this a uh, defines an r module homomorphism rm to rm let's call it uh, t subscript a what does this do t subscript a of a vector v in rm is just a times v now what does t subscript a do to the column space of a x so if i take t subscript a and apply it to the column space of x then that means i'm applying t subscript a to vectors in the column space of x what are vectors in the column space of x well they are vectors of the form xv where v belongs to rn but what is ta of xv well ta of xv is axv where v belongs to rn but ax is y and so this is the column space of y so what we see is that ta maps the column space of x exactly onto the column space of y and because a is in glmr this uh, ta is actually an invertible um, r module homomorphism and therefore it's a bijection so t subscript a maps the column space of x bijectively onto the column space of y it's an isomorphism of the column space of x onto the column space of y so t subscript a is uh, from rn to rn and uh, you have this quotient map from rn to rn mod column space of x and you have the quotient map from rn to rn mod column space of y but this uh, map t subscript a takes the column space of x onto the column space of y so it gives rise to an isomorphism t subscript a bar defined by t subscript a bar of uh, v plus column space of x is equal to t a v plus column space of y and this fact that t subscript a maps the column space of x isomorphically onto the column space of y says that t bar a is a well defined isomorphism from rn mod column space of x to rn mod column space of y I'll let you check that yourself. Now we are ready to the general thing. Suppose that y is a x b, where a is in G L M R and b is in G L N R. Then R n mod column space of x is the same as R n 
mod the column space of x times b so that's isomorphic sorry this should be rm rm mod the column space of a x b which is rm mod the column space of y i guess all these ends need to be m that's it that's done so what we get is that if two matrices x and y are equivalent then when you think of them as uh, matrices of relations they define isomorphic r modules so if i give you two matrices uh, m by n matrices with entries in a ring r how will you decide if uh, they are equivalent or not so this is a decision problem determine if x is equivalent to y these kind of decision problems uh, usually are dealt with um, in two different ways one is the method of finding canonical forms so the idea is that for each equivalence class you find a specific representative which has a very nice form and uh, you can take each element in that class and you perform a certain algorithm you would reduce it to an element in the canonical form and the other is that uh, given an element of your set you just try to compute certain invariants so you just take the matrix x and compute some numbers with it and if you have another matrix y and you compute those numbers and they turn out to be the same then x is equivalent to y so we have these two approaches canonical forms and invariants we'll see that actually the canonical forms approach actually leads us to the discovery of the invariants let's begin with a very simple example uh, let's just take uh, the case where uh, r is equal to f a field okay so the theorem is every matrix x in m m by n f is equivalent to a unique matrix of the form so the form is very simple you have uh, one 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 up to some time and then you have zero 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 after that and everything else is zero so you just have a principal diagonal worth of one this is a rectangular matrix and then you have zeros and uh, well uh, the proof is not very difficult let me first uh, illustrate it uh, with an example So remember the description of um, GLN, uh, GLMR, and GLNR. Well, that works also for a field. So let's start with a matrix like this: one minus one zero zero one minus one uh, one minus two one. And let's try to figure out what its uh, canonical form is. So we'll try to reduce it. This thing is called a canonical form. There's a unique matrix of this kind in each equivalence class so let's try to reduce this to a canonical form so what we want to do is we want to make get zeros here and here so what i'll do is i'll try to take this uh, this one here and try to make it zero okay so what i'll do is i will take uh, the third uh, column and subtract from it the first column and what i get is uh, the right multiplication by one of the shear matrices so it's still in the same equivalence class and this only changes the third column and what I get is 0 uh, minus 1 1 and now I'll try to make this entry here 0 and so now I'll do a row operation I'll take the second row and add 
uh, it to the third row r2 goes to r2 plus r1 and now what you'll get is 1 0 0 add the first row to the second row i'll get um, 0 1 minus 1 0 minus 1 1 and now what should I do? I want to make this uh, entry in the second row and third column zero. So I'll take the third column and add to it the second column. So let's do it uh, like this. Uh, take this third column and add to it the second column. And so what I get is the matrix one zero zero uh, zero one zero zero minus one and here i will get also zero and now i can take the third row and add to it the second row So what should I do? I'll take R3 and take it to R3 plus R2. And what do you get? You get the matrix 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. And this is indeed a matrix of this canonical form. So what we've done is we've started with a more general matrix and by a series of row and column operations we have reduced it to the canonical form that we desire and you can take this process that i've used i've actually been uh, following an algorithm so let me enunciate for you this algorithm so um if a is zero there's nothing to do it's already uh, in a canonical form, uh, this row, there, there, this, there are no ones, so it's just zero everywhere. And uh, otherwise, what you do is by interchanging rows and columns, make sure that a11 is not equal to 0. I mean, you have a non-zero element somewhere in your matrix, say in the i-th row and j-th column. So first you interchange the i-th row with the first row and then the j-th column with the first column and then you would have moved that element from the i-th row and j-th column to the first row and first column. Okay. And uh, now what we'll do is we will kill all the elements of the first row and the first column except for the element in the first row first column the corner top left element so uh, what we have is this situation we have a11 a12 a1n a21 am1 and we have whatever here i'm not particularly interested in what's over here at this moment i'll just put a star here and what I want to do is I want to kill all these things. So what you do now is you take Ri and replace it by Ri minus Ai1 by A11 Ri. So this A11 is non-zero so and we are working over a field so we can definitely divide by A11 and this will have the effect of uh, killing off the element Ai1. And so you do this for i equals 2 to m. And then what you also do is cj goes to cj minus a1j by a11. Sorry, this should be r1 and this should be c1. For j goes from 2 to m. And so now what you've got is you've taken this matrix and you've made all these entries zero. Right, let's use. Okay. 
and you've got some matrix here a prime let's call it and now what you can do is uh, you can repeat uh, similarly with a prime so what you can do is you can interchange rows and columns of a prime and make sure that out here you have a non zero element and then use that to clear out one more row and one more column except for the diagonal entry and when you do these operations on a prime because the corresponding elements in those rows and those columns in the first column and first row of a are zero they will not really disturb the first row and first column of the bigger matrix a and uh, so any uh, row or column operation involving rows 2 to m or columns 2 to n will not affect the first row or the first column and eventually you'll be able to reduce your matrix to uh, reduced uh, this canonical form so what is the meaning of all this so firstly what we note is that um, there are um, minimum mn plus one possible canonical forms right equivalence classes namely with 0 1s 1 1 so on up to minimum mn ones and uh, the class of the matrix 1 1 1 where you have r ones and then 0 is consists of all rank r matrices Um, because if you left multiply or right multiply a matrix by a non-singular matrix then you will not be changing the dimension of its column space and so you will get a matrix of the same rank. So if your original matrix had some rank but then you reduce it to this uh, canonical form with rank R then the original matrix must have had the same rank R. Um, so now we have found the invariant that we wanted so we found we have the canonical form and the invariant is is x is equivalent to y if and only if rank of x is equal to the rank of y and there's even an algorithm uh, for uh, computing rank what is rank of x it's the uh, smallest integer r such that all smallest uh, non negative integer r such that all r by r minors of x are 0. You may have seen this in your linear algebra class. So, this rank has a very nice interpretation in terms of the matrix and is therefore uh, easy to compute quite directly. Mm -hmm.